Welcome to the weekly series of Healthcare Scene Google Plus Hangouts, where we sit down with top leaders in healthcare IT. Before we, be, we begin, I want to remind those watching live to ask any questions you have on the Google Plus Hangout event page, and we'll try to incorporate them into the interview if we have time. Also, we had a little bit of a technical challenge, so we only have the voice instead of the video today, but uh, I'm sure that most people will enjoy listening to this uh, chat, regardless of whether you can see the person or not. So today we're excited to have John Squire, President and COO at Amazing Charts. Before joining Amazing Charts, John Squire had worked for 26 years as a senior software sales and marketing executive at companies as small as startups up through organizations like IBM and Microsoft. Seven months ago, John Squire took over as president and C COO of Amazing Charts, a subsidiary of PrimeMed. I'm pleased to have him here with me today. Welcome, John. Hi, John. Thanks for having me. Good. So let, let's start off our chat. Uh, you know, tell us a little bit of background about yourself and how did you end up at Amazing Charts? Yeah, good, uh, good question. So, um, I, like you said, I spent about 26 years in the software industry, um, really a history of um, building and delivering uh, great products to market. Um, and uh, the last four years I was at Microsoft. I was in charge of all the healthcare partners and I worked with a lot of the big EHR, big EMR vendors got to see what their plans were, their products up close, uh, kind of the market that they paid attention to. Um, and if, if you look at the, the healthcare demographics with more and more patients coming into the system under PAPACA, if you look at um, the dependency, the increased dependency um, on primary care, and then you look at where um, the big players are investing their money. It's not in primary care and it's not in small practice. And um, they're really after acute care specialties, you know, where the money is. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I looked at what was available for primary care and I think, you know, there's something missing here. They're, we're not putting our best foot forward from a technology standpoint. Um, and I found Amazing Charts and Amazing Charts is a player that seemed to be doing it right. They were delivering a good product at a fair price um, and they were uh, uh, increasing physician productivity as opposed to hurting physician productivity and sounded like a place I wanted to spend more time so that's how I wound up being here. Excellent, uh, yeah, I, I've, I've certainly interviewed the Amazing Charts uh, founder many times uh, and even when they were acquired by PrimeMed and you know I, I found similar things to what you described as far as trying to offer it at a reasonable price and trying to help physician productivity. So it sounds like you want to continue those goals. Is, is that your main goals there? Yeah, very much so. Uh, you know, our founder, Dr. John Bertman, was committed to a concept he called kind capitalism. He was uh, very much of the mind of, uh, you know, don't be too salesy. Um, let people know what you do, but don't, don't push it on them. Be honest in the sales process. Sell the product at a fair price and really focus on um, physician uh, productivity and not um, not so much uh, some of the other packages uh, are, are really designed to feed the machine and less to help the individual physician. We really focus on uh, the individual physician productivity and, um, and really the uh, financial wherewithal of the provider. So that's uh, something we remain committed to. Yeah, so I mean, that was a question I was going to ask if you were going to continue the kind capitalism approach that he did. And, and will you be able to do that under the Prime Med umbrella? I mean, what, how's the uh, interaction going there under your ownership? Yeah, so about a year ago, Amazing Charts was uh, purchased by a Prime Med. Prime Med is a provider of continuing medical education. And the, the idea there was really to, again, the, the motivation was to help and be an asset to physicians. Um, uh, CME is a uh, continuing medical education company is always trying to prove the value of their education. What better way to prove the value of the education than to tie it directly to patient outcomes. So PrimeMed's vision is to um, be able to measure patient outcomes or let a physician measure their patient outcomes, um, assess gaps in care, 
And then against those gaps, ran, uh, recommend specific uh, uh, medical education interventions, whether they're online or at a, a live event or even you know some journal articles that you could read to be more up to date on the latest procedures for you know specific uh, disease states that affect your patient population. So it's kind of tailored CME and tailored not just on what you think is good, but what the stats actually say would be good for your patients. Hmm. So that's the that's the motivation there, and and to that end, they've been a good partner um, and have been. Uh, continuing investment in uh, Amazing Charts and continuing uh, for us to grow out the footprint of Amazing Charts with uh, additional functionality, you know, what we have to do mm -hmm. um, for regulatory and, uh, and then what we want to do to improve outcomes. Sure. That, that's interesting. I, I, I know we talked about potentially integrating the uh, continuing CMEs, the continuing education, right into amazing charts, but I hadn't thought about it from a quality of care perspective and from kind of a healthcare analytics, what do you really need to improve the care that you provide to the patients? I think that's an interesting approach. W will that will uh, PrimeMed kind of be hamstrung, though, owning amazing charts? So, you know, or are they looking to integrate that? And maybe this is a question for someone else at PrimeMed, uh, you know, to integrate something similar, or will this just be a unique feature of amazing charts? Um, yeah, so the the plan there would be to make to start out doing it um, just for amazing charts to have our own um, uh, um, test bed, if you will. But then once you actually prove out the process and that it works, that we could generalize that really to take in any uh, EHR data and and you know run through the same the same process to um, recommend targeted CME. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Is there, is there anything yep. else that, uh, you know, during the transition that PrimeMed's been able to bring to the table that wasn't possible before, or, you know, how's the transition there? Uh, the trans tr transition has actually been very smooth. Actually, PrimeMed and Amazing Charts had been working together uh, well before they actually acquired them. Right. Um, Amazing Charts had been an exhibitor at all the PrimeMed events and has built a very loyal customer base uh, you know, around the country, I think, as a result of that. So mm -hmm. um, most companies of, of amazing charts size tend to be more regionally focused and, and we're tremendously diverse uh, in, in terms of geography because of uh, because I think of the partnership with Primate over the years and in, in kind of participating at Primate events and, and um, Recruiting from the PrimeMed um, physician base and clinician base for uh, Amazing Charts users. So, as that, I remember when we, when the acquisition happened, uh, there was some discussion. One of you know that the, the PrimeMed user base could be a great potential marketing arm for for Amazing Charts to sell their product, but also uh, potentially having regional user group meetings. Are those uh, playing out? Are those in the future? Are you looking at more of an annual meeting, or what's your approach there? Yeah, so we're doing those right now. There, there are five major cities that um, PrimeMed has their major events in uh, Boston, Chicago, L.A., Houston, uh, and Fort Lauderdale. And we piggyback on those events and host a user conference, a mini user conference at each of those events. Um, we may, if I've ever worked at, has had a, a single national event um, uh, or in some cases a global event and it, it's a great chance to pull users together together to share experiences and to and to learn you know what other people are doing and 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 have some fun in the process <laughs> um, and we may add a national event in the future but we, we feel we're reaching a in aggregate a larger number of users and enabling more of them to attend these regional events easier to get to um, we also have a day of training we've tacked on the day before, so we, we if you want to come a day early, you can attend a full day of training. Um, and then in the events themselves, we have um, we put more emphasis on users actually presenting what works for them. Uh, we cover a couple of topics, uh, you know, kind of tips and tricks from our um, support gurus and a, a product roadmap from the company, but we, we try to put the emphasis directly on the users um, talking to each other. So, nice. 
Yeah, so we may go back and add a really big national event, but um, it's it's uh, for our in install base more of an expense than most want to take on, and this this tends to work better. Nice. No, I think it's a great approach. I, I love the user events as well. I love getting the hands-on connection with them. So let's take a kind of a shift from uh, the acquisition and talk kind of more about where Amazing Charts is today and where it's headed. Uh, I, I've, I've seen that you're still not 2014 certified, but you have it posted that you're uh, that you should be in early summer 2014. You know, why aren't you already certified? And, and what was your approach there to that timeline? Yeah, sure. Um, so we're behind the eight ball. Um, we we uh, will have our certified release out in June. Um, and uh, that you know we had originally planned to have it out in Q1. Uh, we're not the only ones that laid uh, that are laid. I was looking at some of the statistic oh, <laughs> meaningful use stage one. I think there were 1,300 uh, EHRs that were certified, and for meaningful use stage two, to date, there's something like uh, 211. So that the number of um, Certified EHRs has come down considerably. We plan to be on that list in in just a couple, a few short months, um, and we're already working with customers on alpha and beta versions so that they can see what's coming, and um, and be well, um, uh, you know, well ready for it. So, uh, have you have you gotten a lot of kickback kickback from your customers uh, saying why aren't you certified and they're they're fearful of the timelines or do they understand that they, they really have till October for most of them you know to do the three months? Yeah, well, we're also accommodating those that want to uh, attest in in quarter three, so we're getting early installs for them. Um, we'll actually be through our um, accreditation process uh, in the month of May, okay. so. Um, we're going to go out with an early version for those who want to be installed in June to be ready for October, or sorry, for July 1 to attest uh, July through September. But to answer your question, yeah, the users are concerned, and rightly so. Um, we should have been out in, in Q1 when we said, and we're giving them a shorter window in which to attest, but we plan to hold as many hands as we have to to make every one of them successful. So what was the holdback? Was it the complexity of meaningful use stage two? Was it some inter internal workings, or, or you know? Yeah, all of, all of the above. So um, I think you know I've been at the company about six months. I think some of our internal processes were not quite so mature. So I think we underestimated, in a lot of ways, the effort and the staffing that would go along with uh, MU uh, stage two, um, and. And uh, on top of that, we had some execution mistakes, even within within probably uh, uh, an effort that was scoped uh, too small. So um, we've corrected those. We're on course. We've got a a really solid plan to get the uh, June release out. So we're uh, not so worried about it internally. But um, yeah, um, absolutely, our users are concerned. They voice that concern. We keep them in, informed of our plans, and and we. You know, maintain that level of communication as as best we can at our user groups, through our user bulletin boards, through um, just our customer support organization, and um, and through efforts like this. So, I mean, if there are users um, listening, they should be reassured that um, we'll have our uh, 2014 certified version that is necessary for meaningful use stage two out uh, during the month of June and they'll be ready to go July 1 if they want or if they want to do it during the summer and just the test in Q4 that's a another possibility. Sure. No, I mean you're right. Uh, there, there's a lot of EHR vendors that are they're grinding on it and I think many underestimated the complexity because I think 2014 certification is a huge step up from 2011. So it, you're not alone in this, uh, it, you know, and I think it will be interesting to see come June, July, August, how many of them weren't able to make it versus how many of them were just running a little bit behind. So uh, I think you're right, and actually I saw the list of ones that are certified. There's some big names off that list so far, much bigger than Amazing Charts. Um, so I understand they have a very broad product line and probably a bigger job to do, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, there's uh, we're, we're in some very well-heeled company, put it that way. So. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, it's, uh, it actually brings up a question I've been asking a, a number of EHR vendors, and, and you know, I'd love to maybe even have you do a guest post on my site uh, or even on yours uh, as part of this series, uh, you know, and to go into more depth. But the question I've been asking is, let's imagine you know, meaningful use in EH certif EHR certification was gone. Essentially, there was no incentive money. Would you still do meaningful use if it wasn't tied to that money? And if so, you know, which parts would you... Uh, do you see real value in? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and actually, um, you know, as I've been going around to our events and previewing our meaningful use release, uh -huh. uh, there are a lot of things in there that are useful to people. You know, that are not attesting for meaningful use. The patient portal, for example, um, uh -huh. and and secure direct messaging is something that's required for meaningful use too, but is is useful for everybody. Um, immunization registries. Especially in you know in pediatrics and and in family practice is a is is a pretty big deal, um, and and helps with um, you know data portability, uh, and data portability uh, in meaningful use too. It takes it manifests itself as a CCDA, mm -hmm. but um, uh, just the whole progress uh, from MU1 to MU2 to MU3 and having increased portability in our business with um, with a large uh, focus on primary care, um, is they're they're usually the last to know. You know, when somebody gets discharged from a hospital or is uh, treated by a specialist, um, <laughs> the system doesn't always work like it's supposed to, and they don't always get notified. And and automating that uh, transfer of um, of the, the the visit summary and the and uh, the the information in CCDA will go a long way to helping our population be tied into the bigger health system. So I think there are some very good things in meaningful use. Whether or not a government mandate was the way to make it happen, you know, that's that's a good argument to have. I think. Sure. Um, and um, it will be interesting. Um, we're a very reasonably priced um, EHR. There are some that are much more expensive and and justified their their high cost based on hey you're gonna get money back from the government um, that creates kind of an artificial market you know for some period of time and it will be interesting that um, as the incentives start to tail off and the uh, penalties gear up um, you know how how those vendors will fare as well mm -hmm. so um, I, I don't know if I answered your question I do think there are some worthwhile aspects of meaningful use in general um, I think that the data portability is one uh, I think uh, patient engagement and the ability to uh, communicate uh, physician to physician, patient um, to physician, physician to patient without sending faxes is a welcome change, you know, uh, and, and providing access. Uh, I can tell you um, as, the, uh, as the son of, uh, of elderly parents that are in and out of, uh, you know, uh, the medical system. It's it's nice to have online access to medical records and be able to to uh, track progress and know what's going on, because um, you don't always get it from your parents. <laughs> you don't always get the real story anyway. So it's good, it's good to uh, to have access to those things. So I think there are some very worthwhile efforts within meaningful use, and I think um, the packaging of it into a uh, government funded initiative is another question. Sure. Well, and it brings up another point. I mean, it's interesting. You looked at the numbers and kind of the fallout of EHR vendors that aren't being certified under 2014. But the other fallout that we haven't quite seen yet and the numbers aren't there yet is the question of how many doctors are going to fall out when it comes to meaningful use stage two. How many of them are just going to say, well, I got stage one money. That was enough. I'll just skip stage two. That's too much work. That's too big of a step. And oh well, I'll just take the penalties too. Maybe opt out of Medicare. What you know, whatever the options are there. Uh, do you see this playing out with many doctors saying, you know, kind of shunning stage two and, and saying I'm done with government mandates? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we we do. Um, we've seen so there's a big trend to go concierge only, sure. um, especially in the in the primary care space, um, and uh, we've seen. Several of our customers uh, opt out um, of meaningful use. Some from the beginning, where they said, "I'm just not going to go for it," and some really um, put off 
um, by the pending 23.8 percent cut in in Medicare reimbursements, even though it's been delayed now for a year, mm -hmm. a, a lot of physicians said, "Hey, I just can't live with that. I'm going to find another business model," and they've they've opted out of Medicare altogether. Um, so we we are seeing that to answer your question. Interesting. So do you think, I mean, as I play that out, let's imagine, uh, you know, there is a wave of doctors who, who basically forget meaningful use stage two, take the penalties, whatever they, however they want to address that. Uh, you know, will, will meaningful use matter three to five years from now? Or, I mean, obviously it will have had an impact, but will, will we kind of, MU become a distant menu, memory for us? <laughs> Well, um, I don't think it'll be a distant memory. With it. We're going to be uh, stuck with the legacy of meaningful use, whether it's successful as an initiative or not. And I think you have to say it's been at least partially successful because you did see an increased adoption of, of, uh, of electronic technologies. Yeah. You are seeing these um, uh, increase in um, data portability, um, particularly transfers of care and uh, hopefully seeing those with um, a higher quality so there's less less drop balls so to speak between providers sure. um, but uh, the and then of course patient access and and eventually patient reported data a lot of those things would have happened anyway I believe but um, it, sometimes it sometimes it is good to have an incentive to prime the pump it'll be I think the interesting question is what will of the of the aspects of meaningful use, what will be sustainable? What will what will private industry want to sustain, regardless of a government mandate? Right. Um, and um, proper I well, I think you're gonna I think you're gonna see emphasis on things that lower their costs. I, I don't know a provider out there that didn't want to get rid of faxes. Yeah, it's just <laughs> you know um, you know. Uh, Having some kind of a standard check-in form that everybody can fill out at home, I think you know I, everybody's going to go for that. Uh, you know, you don't have to deal with that with your office staff and everything else. So I think um, there there are some things that that just make market sense and and business sense, sure. and they'll continue continue to live on. And the parts that are extraneous uh, reporting and and other parts, I think will will continue to be fought. Interesting. So kind of switching to uh, our other favorite government regulation, uh, ICD-10 was delayed for another year, as you know. Uh, yep. you know what, what's been Amazing Charts kind of experience with that, reaction to it? I imagine you'd invested some money preparing for it, you know? What were quite you a bit. To? Yeah, quite a bit. Um, and it was in the same release as our meaningful use, so we would have had it out uh, six months or so before the deadline. But... Um, Dropping it just allowed us to increase the quality and the probability of our MU2 release, but um, but we had done 80% of the work already, and yeah, the fact that it that it um, uh, that it dropped out, I think actually for most of the providers, I believe they had no idea the complexity that was involved in mainly getting paid with ICD-10. And the fact that it it did um, it was pushed out a year, I think, gives people a, a chance to grapple with that complexity. Um, and in addition, even from a, a payer standpoint, and more from the billing companies and, and coding companies, um, the, the, their ramp up time also has been extended. And I think that's a, a welcome relief from their point of view. So um, uh, the, the guys I see arguing for it. The, the most were the were the payers who could who who could more discriminate on um, reimbursements based on what's coded now, right? Um, so that's um, they'll have to wait a year. But um, I think the for the small practice, it's it's one more thing they didn't have to deal with in a confined window. And I think that um, uh, it's probably a welcome relief for them not to get the um, increased complexity, even though it could have been more money if you do it correctly, you know, for some of them, yeah. Right. No, no, that's the balance. That's interesting observation that it was the payers. I'd mostly heard the coders complaining. Uh, I mean, even coders that trained completely on ICD-10 and now they don't have a job possibility, but, you know, but I, I don't know a single provider who's upset with it. I haven't met one of those yet. So No, exactly. You're not going to get it in the provider community. It's more on the payer side. And, and you're right. The coders that had geared up and staffed up for right. it, um, and, and, and in some cases sold contracts to do conversion work, et cetera, 
um, they're they're backpedaling now on those, and that's uh, that's you know um, that that's unfortunate, and that's a uh, that is the the tail wagging the dog in terms of the government stepping in and saying, hey, we're going to push this back a year. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, there's a few EHR vendors too that are angry. Like we did it right, you know. You should punish those that aren't staying up. But I think everyone would have been ready from an EHR vendor perspective. So, uh, you know, look, you know, we're we're at the end of our time, but I thought I'd finish up with a kind of a question. Uh, you know, where where is Amazing Charts going in the next five years? Where are you taking the software development? What features are you focused on? You know, beyond of course the regulation that you have to do uh, meaningfully. Sure. Well, there's a technology answer to that, and there's a, a more philosophical answer. Philosophically, we are driven by our our founder's vision. We want to be an asset to our providers. They're under a crushing um, burden of uh, regulatory uh, requirements, reporting. Um, you know the the changes that you mentioned around meaningful use and so forth. We'd like to take that off their back as mm -hmm. much as possible. And if there's one, and it's it's reason, honestly the reason I came to the company. If there's one place technology should make a difference, it's in that small practice to deal with these things that are repeatable and can be codified. So um, uh, we're going to remain strong, to, you know, and true to that mission. Um, so yes, we're going to do the things we have to do for regulatory, for meaningful use, for ICD-10. But we also want to do things that just increase productivity. And let our providers, you know, get home earlier in the day rather than staying at later at night doing um, documentation. Um, so things that increase productivity is one category. Uh, another category would be things that increase their reimbursements. So the marriage between um, a practice management solution that does the billing submissions and the um, and the EHR to make sure that we're coding things that are maximizing their reimbursements on the practice management side. So that's another area, uh, and then the 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 t two more areas that we mentioned. One was patient engagement, uh, and the ability for the physicians to uh, engage with patients in a in a low touch way that takes some of the burden um, off of the staff, uh, you know, before a visit and in the inner visit state, and also helps them manage the chronic patient populations. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's another area of investment. And then behind it all, I, I hate to say it, but um, uh, you know, big data and analytics play a role in simplifying some of the reporting that these guys need to do and tracking their outcomes. And so we're building out a, a layer of very simple, I would say, analytics um, into amazing charts so that they can track their progress against these goals, whether they're doing it for the government or for themselves, mm -hmm. uh, and, and can... Um, can know what the what the data really says, rather than a payer, for example, sending them a scorecard and and telling them uh, you know what their outcomes are doing. They can actually report on it themselves. So, so is that that's all the meaningful analytics. Is that <laughs> meaningful use analytics? You know, um, NCQA data. Um, uh, some someone uh, um, get a, a patient-centered medical home uh, certification. Sure. Um, you know the qual the the HEDIS and the multiple quality uh, uh, yardsticks that are out there. Um, so it's really m measuring um, physician performance or measuring patient outcomes uh, against those standards um, and letting them adjust those standards. If you have a geri geriatric population, it's going to be slightly different numbers than you know if you've got a, a, a normal healthy population or a pediatric population. So letting them adjust those standards to what makes sense for their patient population and, and tracking to that. So, um, and again, that's that's something that is a regulatory burden just to produce all these reports, but also something that could actually help their um, their outcomes over time as well. Excellent. Well, I, I thank you so much for uh, taking the time to, to be with us and, and share kind of the state of amazing charts and, and somewhat the EHR business in general. So we'll have to have you back again. Thank you, John. Thanks very much for having me. I enjoyed it. All right. Great.